Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. Today, we return to the listener library for an episode of Suspense, recommended by our mysterious listener and Patreon supporter, Jessica. Jessica writes, I've been listening to a lot of suspense lately purposefully reaching for the ones I've never heard before. And two sharp knives impressed me so much, I had to reach out and request it for the podcast. Suspense aired on CBS Radio from 1942 to 1962, producing 947 episodes in total, most of which still exist today. Hailed as radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense specialized in edge-of-your-seat thrillers, some written especially for radio, others adapted from contemporary and classic literature. Two Sharp Knives was adapted from a short story by Dashiell Hammett, first published in Collier's Magazine, January 13, 1934, and later collected in the 1944 anthology Stories for Men. The story made the leap to television in 1949 as part of the CBS anthology series Studio One. This televised version of the story featured a brief cameo appearance from Dashiell Hammett and is believed to be the only known recording of his voice. Two Sharp Knives was presented twice on Suspense, once during the program's debut season and again in 1945. Today, we are listening to the first production originally aired December 22, 1942. It's late at night and a chill has set in. You're alone and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker, listen to the music, and listen to the voices. Suspense. Tonight, Columbia brings you as guest star, Hollywood's genial character actor, Stuart Irwin. The story is by the author of The Thin Man and the Maltese Falcon, Dashiell Hammett, one of America's acknowledged masters of the art of suspense. Suspense is compounded of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. In this series are stories calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. Tonight, for instance, Stuart Irwin plays for us a pleasant, easygoing assistant chief of police in a small town who, to everyone's surprise, was instrumental in solving a murder. We trust that with this tale we shall keep you in... Suspense. For Suspense tonight, CBS presents Stuart Irwin in Two Sharp Knives by Dashiell Hammett. Shortly after 2 a.m., a poker game had just broken up at Ben Camdley's, the doctor coroner of Deerwood City. Scott Anderson, Deerwood's chief of police, and Wally Shane, his assistant, were standing outside. Where are we heading for, Scott? Let's walk across the street, Wally. Railroad station. Gee, aren't you afraid of the excitement, Chief? Don't you think that watching the 211 come in is apt to be too much for your blood pressure? Well, if it is, Wally, you can always carry on. You've been a pretty good imitation of an assistant to me for some time now. Yeah? Yeah. If anything happens to me, you'd be the chief. Don't worry. It won't be any harder for you to fool the public as chief. Hi, Elmer. Uh, howdy, Scott. Uh, hi, hello, Wally. Kind of late for you boys to be around, ain't it? No, I don't know. We sort of figured we'd put the town to bed tonight. How's the 211? On time? Right on the nose. She ought to be blowing for the bend in just about three seconds now. Yep. What'd I tell you? It's her now. Expecting anyone on her, Scott? 
No, I'm, I'm not expecting anyone. Well, and I just thought we'd come over and watch you come in, that's all. You know, Elmer, you never can tell who might get off, though. Dick Turpin, Henry Morgan, Jesse James, Dick, Jack the Ripper, or six officers of Murder Incorporated, or even your Aunt Gussie. I guess you're right, Wally. Well, here she be. Pardon me, Jinx, but I gotta be rolling the wagon out to the baggage car. Well, can't complain. Can't complain, Cap. Well, maybe you can, Elmer, but I sure can if you hold us up with that freight there. You got much more? Nope. This is the last piece now. There you are, Cap. All done. Okay. See you tomorrow, Elmer. Hey, Scott. Do you see what I see? I mean, do I see the man who just got off that train? The answer's yes. Well, he's a ringer for the guy we got a picture of. That is the guy. Well, then, what do we do now? We take him, Wally. My car's at the corner of the alley. Oh, but, Scott... We'll tail him up the street. Okay, Scott. There he goes now, over toward the taxi stand. Come on. Let's follow him. Hello, Farman. Huh? Oh, I... I don't believe You're Mr. I... Farman, aren't you? Yes, I am. Philadelphia? Yes. I'm Scott Anderson, Chief of Police. What? Chief of... What's happened to her? Happened to who? Oh, oh no, you don't. No. Let me go. Oh, no. You think you can pull that sort of stuff okay. with me? You're very much... Let me get a that mug. Oh, no, no, no. Wait a minute. No. Wait a minute, Hold gentlemen. it, Wally. Well, Furman? Well, I... I am sorry. For a moment there, I thought you weren't really a policeman. Thanks. It's nice to know I look almost human. Yes, it... It was silly of me. I'm I'm sorry. Well, let's get going now before anything else happens. Okay, Furman, get in the car. I'll drive, Scott. Anyhow. I'll, uh, are you taking me to police headquarters? That's right. What for? Philadelphia. I, uh, I don't think I understand. You understand that you're wanted in Philadelphia for murder, don't you? Murder? Why, that's ridiculous. That's... Who told you that? Well, it's a cinch he didn't make it up. But wait, there, there must be... Take it easy thing. now. Just wait till we get down to headquarters. And I'll show you what I mean. Now then, here's the circular on Lester Furman. It was sent out by the Trans-America Detective Agency in Philadelphia. Take a look at it. Oh, uh, $1,500 reward for the arrest and conviction of Lester Furman, alias Lloyd Fields, alias J.D. Carpenter, for the... for the murder of Paul Frank Dunlap in Philadelphia on December 8th, 1942. Well... Uh, it's a lie. You're firm, aren't you? Oh, yes, but... That's your picture on the circular, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes, but I... Well, I... Scott, I see you and Wally got firm, huh? Oh, hello, George. Uh, you lucky stiffs. Now you two split a grand and a half reward. i uh, never seen nothing like it. You know, if it ain't vacations in New York at the city's expense, it's reward, though. Judge, someday, if you don't remember you're the jailer around here, not the D.A., Hmm? You're going to be wearing your teeth on the outside of your lips, and I'll be the guys who arrange them that way. Savvy? Uh, just because you caught a guy who's hot in Philadelphia. It's a lie. It's a frame-up. You can't prove anything. There's nothing to prove. I never killed anybody. I won't be framed. Take it I easy, won't be framed. Furman. Take it easy. You're wasting your breath on us. Save it for the Philadelphia police. We're just holding you for them. But it's not the police. It's the Trans-America we Detective... turn you over to the Philadelphia police. Mr. Anderson, I... I... Well... Then, then there's nothing I can do now? There's nothing any of us can do till morning. We'll have to search you now, then we won't bother you anymore till they come for you. But I... Wally, you look through his bag. I'll see what he's got in his pockets. Okay, Scott. Well, all he's got on him are some business cards, a few letters, a hundred and... $160, a book of checks in the Philadelphia bank, and a few odds and ends. What's with the bag, Wally? Not much. A couple of changes of clothes, some toilet articles, and... Oh, here's a 38. Loaded. Pretty little thing, isn't it? Okay, put those things in what I got in the vault. All right, George. 
You can take Furman now and lock him up. This is the most ridiculous come thing. Come along, I've... darling. Come on. We ain't had nobody in our little hoosco for three days running. Hey, yeah. Uh, you'll have it all to yourself. Just like a sweet of the rich. What time? Go on in, you go. I tell you, 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 you're making a mistake. I demand to be allowed to get in touch with my lawyer. I. Hey, how about you boys cutting me in on a little of that blood money, huh? No, oh, sure, George, sure. I'll forget all about that two and a half you've been owing me for three mm-hmm. months. Make Furman as comfortable as you can, George. Take good care of him. He's valuable, huh? Yeah, now, if it was some bum that didn't mean a nickel to you... George, any day now, I'm going to forget that your uncle is county chairman and throw you back in the gutter just to see how high he'll bounce. Remember that. Oh, Scott, I, I didn't mean nothing. That's I... all, George. Never mind the rest. I'm going home now. If anything's urgent, I can reach there. But get this. I don't want to be disturbed. Unless it is urgent. What time is it? It's five after six in the morning, and you'd better come right down, Scott. That fellow Furman's hung himself. What? Furman hung himself? Yep, by his belt, from a window bar. Dead in a mackerel. I'll be right in, Wally. Phone Doc Camsley and tell him I'll pick him up on my way down. No doctor's going to do Furman any good, Scott. Well, it won't hurt to have him looked at. You'd better phone the chronic court at Douglasville, too, and file a routine report. Already did that. And what's more, hold on to your seat. The DA's on his way over, in person. The DA? Yeah. I'll be there before you hang up, Wally. <laughs> Chief, Ted Carroll, the DA, is here, and he's plenty hot under the collar. What's he burning about? Oh, he's just mad, running up quite a phone bill on us, too. Been calling Philadelphia every couple of minutes since he got here. What kept you so long? Oh, I couldn't get my car started. Well, right, let's go in and see the old buzzard. Oh, Ted? Listen, Scott, what is all this? Oh, well, what? There's some funny business going on here. What's funny about it? Man hangs himself. Just another case of suicide. Sure, it was suicide. But I just telephoned Transamerica. Dug a guy out of bed there. And he said they'd never sent out circulars on Furman. Didn't know about any murder he was wanted for. All they could tell me about him was he used to be a client of theirs. You don't know what to say, Ted. I don't either. Oh, a fine chief of police you are. What on earth kept you so long? Castor. Came as quick as I could. Ain't you so crabby, Ted? Nothing. I guess it's just the district attorney and... Ah, now, come, come, gentlemen. Nobody'd know you two are staunch admirers of each other. (laughs) Okay, Wally. Tell me, what do you make of it? Well, there's plenty wrong, Scott. First, that Trans-America thing. They never sent out circulars about Furman. And now, get this. I talked to the Philly police just before you came in. There wasn't even any Paul Frank Dunlap murdered. There wasn't? No, what did you get out of Furman before you let him hang himself? That he was innocent. Didn't you grill him? Didn't you find out what he was doing in town? Wally, didn't you? What for? He admitted he was Furman. The description fitted him. The photograph was him. The Transamerica Detective Agency is supposed to be on the level, ain't it? Philadelphia wanted Furman. We didn't. But Scott... I sure, Ted. If I'd have known he was going to hang himself. Yeah, but then if your aunt wore pants, you'd be your uncle. You said Furman had been a client of Transamerica. They tell you what the job they did for him was? His wife left him a couple of years ago, and he had them hunting for her for five or six months. But they never found her. They're sending a man up here tonight to look things over. Yeah, huh? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going out and grab a quick bite. But I might as well tell you, Scott, there's going to be trouble over this. I know that, Ted. It usually is when somebody dies in a jail cell. <laughs> Become of that 1,500 fish now, eh, Scott? What happened there last night, George? Nothing. Furman hung himself. Did you find him? Uh-huh. Wally took a look in here to see how things was before he went off duty, and he found him. You're asleep, I suppose. Well, uh, I was catching a nap, I guess, but 
Everybody does that sometimes, Scott. Even Wally sometimes when he comes in off his beat between rounds. Yeah, but I always wake up when the phone rings or anything. Oh, sure. Well, suppose I had been awake. Can't hear a guy hanging himself, can you? Did Doc Cantley say how long Furman had been dead? Yeah, he done it about five o'clock, he said he guessed. Oh, you want to look at the remains, Scott? They're over at Fritz's undertaking parlor. Not now. Hey, and speaking of Furman, what are you going to tell the guys from Transamerica when they show up here tonight? <laughs> Come in, come in. Oh, uh, they, they told me I'd find you here. You're Chief Anderson, aren't you? Yes, that's right. I'm Carl Reising, assistant manager of the Trans-America Detective Agency in Philadelphia. This is Mr. Wheelock, who is Lester Furman's personal attorney. Glad to know you, Mr. Reising. How do you do, Mr. Wheelock? Hmm. How do you do? I know you gentlemen are already in possession of most of the details concerning Mr. Furman from the time he arrived in Deerwood until the time of his death. But perhaps you don't know that the police of most towns in our corner of the state have also received copies of this same reward circular. Take a look at it. Oh. Oh. I must say this circular is an excellent forgery. You're sure it's a forgery, Mr. Easing? Oh, yes. There's no doubt about it. But it's an excellent forgery. Tell me, Mr. Wheelock, was Mr. Furman a native Philadelphian? Oh, my, yes. He was a well-known, respectable, and prosperous citizen of Philadelphia. Married, I believe. In 1934, he married a 22-year-old girl named Ethel Bryan, daughter of a Philadelphia family. And the Furman's had a child. Isn't that right, Mr. Wheeler? Yes, born in 1936, but the child lived only a few months. Mr. Furman's wife disappeared after the child's death. Uh, what year was it that she disappeared? Mr. Reising should remember that. His agency worked on the matter. Oh, I remember it well. Uh, Mrs. Furman disappeared in 1937. We never heard anything of her again, although Furman spent a lot of money trying to locate her. What did she look like, Mr. Tracy? Oh, in just a moment, I, I have a picture of her right here in my briefcase. Ah, here it is. Quite pretty, isn't she? If you care for that type. I see what you mean, Mr. Wheeler. Well, she's attractive as that. Judging by this photo, I'd say that she was a small-featured, pretty blonde, with a weak mouth and large, somewhat staring eyes. Oh, that's an accurate enough description, all right. If you don't mind, I'd like to have a copy made of that photograph, Mr. Reesing. Oh, you can keep that one if you like. It's one that we had made up at Transamerica. Uh, her description's on the back. Thanks. Did uh, Furman ever divorce her? No, sir. He was a lot in love with her, and he seemed to think that the child's dying made her a little screwy so that she didn't know what she was doing. Uh, that's right, isn't it, Mr. Wheelock? That is my belief, Mr. Reesing. Uh, you said Furman had money, Mr. Wheelock. Uh, about how much did he have? And who gets it? I should say his estate will amount to perhaps a half a million dollars left in its entirety to his wife. Mm -hmm. It's quite a handy sum for anyone to have, I'd say. Mr. Wheeler, everything shows that somebody framed Furman into the Daywood jail. And that frame-up drove him to suicide. But there has to be something else. A lot else. Well, then, what are you going to do? I'm going across the street to the undertaking parlor and have a look at Furman. I'll see you later. Hello, Doc. Hi, Scott. I figured you'd come over here to the undertakers pretty soon. What's in your mind, Doc? Uh, let's uh, get out of this crowd. I, I want to tell you something. I just got rid of two guys in my office. Let's go back there. Suits me. Two of those uh, bruises uh, showed, Scott. What bruises? Furman. Well, up under the hair, there were there were two bruises. Well, why didn't you tell me? I'm telling you now, Scott. You weren't here when I made my examination. This is the first time I've seen you since then. Why didn't you spill the stuff about Furman's bruises when you were testifying at the inquest, Ben? Uh, I'm a friend of yours. Do I want to put you on a spot where people can say you drove this champ to suicide by third-degreeing him too rough? Ah, you're nuts. How bad was Furman's head? Well, Scott, uh, that didn't kill him, if that's what you mean. Yeah, there's nothing the matter with his skull. Just a couple of bruises nobody had noticed, and unless they parted the hair. I thought you ought to know, though. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. 
Yes, who is it? This is Fritz, the undertaker. Listen, Scott, there's a couple of ladies over here that want to take a look at Furman. Is it all right? Who are they? I don't know. I'm strangers. What do they want to see him for? I don't know. Wait a minute. Can I please see him? Why do you want to see him? Well, I... I'm... his wife. Furman's wife? Yes. Oh, 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 certainly. I'll be right over. So long, Ben. I've got to go back to the undertakers. So long, Scott. Hey, Scott. What do you want, Wally? I want to talk to you a minute. Over here where we won't be seen. Okay, what is it? A couple of dames came into Fritz's undertaking place just as I was leaving. One of them's Hotshaw Randall, a babe with a record as long as your arm. She's one of that mob you had me working on in New York last summer. Does she know you? Sure, but not by my right name. She thinks I'm a Detroit rum runner. I mean, did she recognize you just now? I don't think she saw me. Anyway, she didn't give me a tumble. You don't know the other one? No, she's a blonde, kind of pretty. Okay, Wally. Stick around a while, but stay out of sight. Maybe I'll be bringing these dolls back with me. Whatever you say, Chief. Oh, there you are, Scott. I wondered when you were coming. Uh, this is Mrs. Furman, and this is Mrs. Crowder. How do you do? Hiya, Chief. They just saw the body. Mrs. Crowder? I thought your name was Randall. What do you care, Chief? I'm not hurting your town any. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me Chief. You city slickers, I'm the town whittler. Thank you for letting me see him. It's all right, Mrs. Furman. But I'll have to ask you and your friends some questions. So if you'll just come across the street to headquarters, we'll get on with the routine. <laughs> any questions, I want to tell you something. Mrs. Furman, your husband didn't commit suicide. He was murdered. Murdered? Ah, oh, Chief, we got alibis. We were in New York, and we can prove it. And you're likely to get a chance, Tim. What brought you down here, anyway? Murdered? Well, who's got a better right to come down here? She was still his wife, wasn't she? She's got a right to look out for her own interests, hasn't she? Mm-hmm. Uh, it reminds me of something. Uh, excuse me a second. Uh, I've got to make a phone call in the next room. Officer Hamill speaking. This is Scott. Yes? Is Wally around? No, he's not here. He said you told him to keep out of sight. I'll find him for you, though. Right. Uh, tell Wally I want him to go to New York tonight. Send Mason home to get some sleep. He'll have to take over Wally's night trick. Oh. Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, do you think I had, had anything to do with Lester's, with his death? I don't know, Mrs. Furman. I know he was killed. I also know he left you something like half a million. Wow, dollars? Dollars. All right, Chief. Let's stop clowning. The kid here didn't have a thing to do with whatever you think happened. No? No. We read about Lester Furman committing suicide in yesterday morning's paper. And about there being something funny about it. And I persuaded her she ought to come down to Mr. deal with Mr. Anderson, I wouldn't have done anything to hurt Lester. I left him because I wanted to leave him. I wouldn't have done anything to hurt him for, for money or anything else. Had I wanted money from him, I would only have had to ask him for it. That's the truth, Chief. For years I've been telling Ethel she was a chump not to tap him. But she never would. I wouldn't have hurt him. Why'd you leave him then? Oh, I don't know how to say it. The way we lived wasn't the way I wanted to live. I wanted... Oh, I don't know what. Anyway, after the baby died, I, I couldn't stand it anymore. Excuse me. Hello? Oh, yeah, Hammer? Hmm? You gave Wally the message? Yes, yes, I want him to go to New York tonight. Okay, where is he? Home? He is home, huh? Okay, thanks. This is, uh, Furman. Uh, this circular that got your husband in the jail. Did you ever see that picture before? No. Well, that's... It can't be. It, it's a snapshot I have. It's an enlargement of it. Who else has one? Well, nobody that I know of. I don't think anyone else could have one. You've still got yours? Yes. I don't remember whether I've seen it recently. It's, it's with some old papers and things. But I must have it. Well, Mrs. Furman, it's stuff like that that's got to be checked up. Neither of us can dodge it. There's two ways we can play it. 
Yes. Miss Berman, I can hold you here on suspicion until I've had time to investigate things. Or I can send one of my men with you to check up in New York. Yes. I'm willing to do that if you'll speed things up by helping them all you can. If you'll promise you won't try any tricks. I promise. I'm as anxious as you are. All right. Not... All right. How'd you come down? We drove down. We got a great big car. That's my car, see? That big green job across the street. Yeah. yeah. And my man can ride back with you, but no funny business. Oh, don't worry, Chief. Come on. We're going to see Wally Shane. The man is going to drive to New York with you. Wally? Who is it? Scott, Wally. Come in. Ladies first. Harry. Harry. Ethel. No, you don't. No, you don't. No use reaching with that gun, Wally. Already got you covered. I guess you win, Scott. Yeah, I guess I do. Come along back to headquarters with me like a good little boy. Holly, you're under arrest for murder. Well, and that's how I knew it was all up, Scott, the minute I saw those two dames going into Fritz's. Then when I was ducking out of sight, I ran into you, and I was afraid you'd take me over there with you, so I had to tell you one of them knew me, figuring you'd want to keep me undercover for a little while anyhow, long enough for me to get out of town. Why didn't you get out, Wally? Well, I dropped in home to pick up a couple of things before I scram, and that phone call of Hamels catches me, and, and I fall for it. You see, Scott, I figured you're not on to me yet, and are going to send me back to New York to see what dope I can get out of the dames. Well, you fooled me, brother. And I thought you'd fall for that. Then you didn't just stumble into all this accidentally, did you? No, I didn't, Wally. I figured Perman had to be murdered by a copper. The no reward circuit was well enough to make a good job of forging one. Incidentally, who printed that Perman circular for you, Wally? Now, I'm not dragging anyone in with me. It was only a poor mug that needed dough. Okay, Wally. You see, I knew only a copper would be sure enough of the routine to know how things would be handled. Only one of my coppers would be able to walk in a permanent cell, bang him across the head, and string him up on the... Those bruises showed, you know, Wally. They did? I guess I should have wrapped two towels around that blackjack. No, oh, gee, Scott. I seem to have slipped up on a lot of things. So that narrows it down to my coppers, and... Well, you told me you knew the Randall woman. There it was. Only I figured you were working with him. What got you like this, Wally? Same thing that gets most saps into jams, a yen for easy dough. And I was in New York, see, Scott, working that Dutton job for you, palling around with big shot racketeers, passing for one of them, and... Yes? Well, I got to figuring that my work takes more brains than theirs, and they're taking in big money, and I'm working for coffee and cakes. That kind of stuff gets you, Scott. Anyway, it got me. Mm-hmm. Then I ran into this Ethel Furman, and she goes for me like a house of fire. I liked her, too, see, so that's dandy. But one night, she tells me about how much dough her husband's got and how he feels about her, and I get to thinking... Thinking what? I think she's nuts enough about me to marry me. So I get to thinking, suppose he died and left her his role. Mm-hmm. I see. So I run down to Philly a couple of afternoons and look Furman up, and everything looks fine. I took my time working out the details, meanwhile writing to her through a fellow in Detroit. Go on. Finish one. Well, I decided to do it. I sent those circulars out to a lot of places, not wanting to point too much to this one. And then when I was ready, I phoned Furman, telling him to come to Deerwood Hotel that night. And sometime before the next night, he'd hear from his wife, Ethel. I knew he'd fall for any trap that was baited with her. Only I guess I'm not as sharp as I thought I was, Scott. Maybe yeah, Wally. Maybe yeah. That doesn't always help. Old man Camsley, Ben's father, used to have a saying. To a sharp knife comes a tough steak. Well, it's how you did it, Wally. I always liked you. I know you did, Scott. 
I was counting on that. Dashiell Hammett's Two Sharp Knives, starring Stuart Irwin. Tonight's story of... Suspense. Columbia presents these tales of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next week, suspense will not be heard because of a special holiday broadcast. Columbia's review of the events of the year. Twelve crowded months, which has been scheduled. On the following Tuesday, January 5th, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, and Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor, are collaborators on Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. That was Two Sharp Knives from Suspense here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. That came to us from our Patreon, Jess. Hi, Jess. We uh, love that you gave us a a suggestion. Uh, Always nice to listen to Suspense. And uh, where do we start the ball rolling on this? I well, I did excited. not include the entirety of Jessica's email in the opening, so I did want to. USOBs owe me money. <laughs> Put in a small bag. <laughs> yeah, I took all the threats out. Yes. Okay. <laughs> no, some of them were spoilers, so I did want to uh, go back and say that uh, she identified a few elements of the story that she found particularly enjoyable, and that might help us know where to start here, including. The red herring sprinkled throughout yep. uh, in order to obscure the twist ending, which she also really enjoyed. The snappy dialogue, of course, it's Hammett. Mm-hmm. After all, uh, she mentioned the delightful train sounds at the top. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and finally made an interesting observation that uh, Scott and Wally had a definite Dylan and Chester vibe. To uh, front gun smoke kind of yes. thing? Yeah, I, I would, would agree with that maybe take it a step farther and say I could see this entire story transplanted to Gunsmoke. Right. It really had that vibe. It's the small town. And Chester uh, so- retires like, I'm out of this show. Do whatever you want my character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can see Chester finally getting tired of living in Dylan's shadow. <laughs> right. And finding a way out, but of course screwing it up because Chester. <laughs> right. Just to rip the Band-Aid off, I can't find the words to describe how much I love this. I enjoyed this so much. It's a straightforward mystery that the production value, the performance, the dialogue, the plot, it, all of it. I liked everything about this so, so much. It was so in my wheelhouse. Um, I would say that I only have one small, really tiny, minuscule like note. And that is some of the voices were really similar so there was a half a beat of who's that. Yeah, early but, on, trying because it matters who's where, who's doing yes. what. That if there's any confusion, I know I wanted like, all right, stop. Who was that guy? Who was that guy? You had no doubt who the doctor was with the big accent. But when the guy from the, uh, I forget what they're called, the people that the didn't put out the... Trans-American, Trans-American Detective American, Agency. When he shows up or the district attorney shows up, they all kind of sounded like the sheriff a little bit for a few seconds until I was able to... But again, that's so nitpicky. I just wanted to get it out of the way at the top as I go back into my love fest. I think it's a side effect of how many characters are in this. Yeah. Because it is a mystery. And it is different from later suspense in that it has a bigger cast. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. as I was listening to it, I realized that, wow, uh, once you get into the real prime 1940 suspense, it's usually a cast of about three people with any major number of lines and right. then a few throwaway incidental characters. But here, it's a large cast of characters. Yeah, and in particular, it was when he insulted George a second time. 
I thought, what? Oh, is this the same guy he insulted, or is this right. a new guy's insulting? It's just, it's the same guy. Just got lots of insults for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just so many interesting human moments in this. I th- one of my favorite lines from this has nothing to do with the plot. You know, why did you leave your husband? Well, you know, I wanted to. I, I don't know what I wanted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was very interesting because you know darn well that she knows exactly what she wanted of how it was performed and how it was written it comes across as ah, that's embarrassing to say out loud <laughs> right well, yeah and also, and it's cr- how many people in the world have had a relationship like why did you end that relationship that's the correct answer right right <laughs> i don't know what i wanted but to take freedom it- Take it even a step further back in the plot, they mentioned that they lost a child. Yes. So it has this depth of reality that some hard-boiled stuff doesn't. Mm -hmm. I appreciated that Ethel is not this garden-variety film noir floozy. Yeah. There's a natural, relatable, tragic past there that grounds that character. Although, Although she brings the friend, friend who is named right. Hacha. So yeah. you still get some of that tough talking, wise cracking lady yeah. in there, which was right. nice. I do not have hard boiled and noir in my DNA, I think to the same degree you guys do. So I felt myself in the mystery, in like, all right, there's a mystery to be solved here. And we get to the point of like, aha, it could really only be this one person. Why is this not in a parlor? How is this not being just laid out for me piece by piece. And why is there still so much story left to go? Uh, and it, I really enjoyed that. appreciated that of like, because this is a story in which the point is to go talk to this guy, knowing like both of you, knowing the jig is up. Uh, and the interesting, enjoyable part is that conversation they have at the end. Yes. Are you saying that you I'm saying it goes against my natural rhythms of listening to a gotcha. mystery. Right. When did you figure out it was Wally? Did you figure out right along with him? Pretty much. I mean, once it was clear that he had been to New York, I can't remember what the details were. The, the details are when he uh, tells Scott that, ooh, oh, one of right. those women knows me. me from New I York. should probably not be involved in this. I didn't know at that point. Okay. Because that's when Scott, at least he claims later when he's talking to Wally, that's when he realized it. I realized it when I was told. <laughs> I did not have any... I wasn't looking for clues, you know what I mean? I was just listening to what was happening. I wasn't trying to solve anything. Well, and of course, the big red herring is in the introduction, um, where they talk about the assistant police chief who helped solve this crime. I can't remember the exact phrasing, but it made me think, like, up until this point, I'd be really suspicious of him, but... Right. Wally? Yeah. Yeah, oh, there are a lot of red herrings to keep you from thinking it's Wally. I'm but not my... just in the plot. Like, the it, it, the narrator says at the beginning, this crime is solved because of this guy. Yeah, and there's a line that Scott says that you've been a pretty good assistant yes. to me, and uh, you'll do a good job. You know, you'll be able to pretend like I do, um, and people will trust you, uh, which is a great red herring because they're in that line... Uh, as Scott and Wally are leaving a poker game at 2 in the morning. There's clearly not much going on in this town to go watch the trains come in. Um, Sounds like you don't You don't think much of this guy, Scott, at that moment, right? He could be just easygoing town sheriff. He could be lazy. He could be corrupt. And maybe I brought some of my hard-boiled priors to this because my suspicion throughout the entire thing was on well, Scott. Scott. Yeah. Or the first half. Yeah. Um, obviously, because you then get to the jail and George, the jailer, accuses him of being after more reward money, mm-hmm. which suggests that he has collected a lot of easy reward money in the past. And- For a long time in this, I was like, maybe this isn't a cut and dried mystery. Maybe they think it is. And it turns out, please bear with me on this. It could be anything. He, he's an alien. He's, you know, sure. like I yeah. was like, this could be, this could go anywhere. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what's going on. Maybe was it just a giant lie? Uh, maybe he had amnesia. You know, I, this, I was so on board with anything could happen and I'd be okay with it. Well, there's that line of like, when somebody, when a prisoner dies in jail, there's trouble that follows. And I'm like, not always, but yes, in this case, I, <laughs> I, I take the point. Yeah, I was actually, that line actually struck me as, yeah, at the very least, paperwork and an inquiry. 
Yeah. You know, that's trouble as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> right? But the oh. twist of there, this guy is not wanted, that was a yeah. really fun twist yep. in the story. But to Tim's not always point, uh, there's <laughs> that scene where the coroner calls Scott aside yeah. and we find out that he, the coroner, lied at the um, inquest yeah. Yeah. to cover up what he presumes was police violence on the part of Scott. And Scott's like, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> for once, I didn't beat the guy. You know? yeah. But again, it's unclear enough in that moment that, oh, is that a habit yeah. of Scott's? Right. Yeah. Or is this just the trappings of 1930s hard-boiled cop stuff? Is that yeah, the crooks are hard, the cops are hard, the everyone is just hard. like, look suspicious, I don't want to be suspicious, Yeah, uh, defer yeah. to discretion. Yeah, or is the coroner thinking... I don't want to end up hanging in a jail cell, yeah. so I want to let right. you know that I covered up for you. And, and these are all just little details that are sprinkled throughout, which make it so detailed and fun to listen to. Mm-hmm. I would say my one flaw that I would be a jerk and point out <laughs> is the one bit of absolutely unneeded clunky dialogue where Scott is shown a picture of Ethel Oh. And he describes oh, yeah. to a room of men who are also looking at the picture <laughs> what she looks like. And then even to the point they try to kind of put a lampshade on it. And we're like, yep, I would say that's an accurate description. <laughs> Someone says after he's done. Yeah, the idea of and it, if, if that's your sort of thing. And what was, I think, egregious about it is that at no point in the the story does it become important that you as a listener right. need to know some physical trait about yeah. Ethel. It's right. the adapter, I assume it's John Dixon Carr, must have just liked Hammett's description of mm. her and wanted to find a way to cram it in. That could very well be. Because I thought that, when he was on the phone, like, there's these two women here. Does one of them look exactly like this? Yeah, I <laughs> thought, well, boy, you went out of your way to get this description in. It must be important. Nope. <laughs> She's blonde. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> The other thing I love about this, and it's something that I enjoy in general, is that the meaning of a title does not become explicit until you finish a story. Oh to me, my that's gosh, always yeah. fun. And this is a great example of that. And then also leaves you to think for a moment how it is applicable yeah. to what you just heard. And it's a great saying, which I've never heard. Me neither. I really to a it. sharp knife comes a tough steak. Mm-hmm. And then I go, oh, cool. And then I went, wait, but that's one sharp knife. <laughs> Who's the second sharp knife? What's his tough steak? Yeah. And I think the yeah. second sharp knife is it's obviously Scott. Scott. Yeah. yeah. His tough steak was having to catch Wally. So it, it, just even having to think for that one second was just really fun to put it all together. Yeah, I it felt didn't like think the at all. bow on the story for me. Yeah, I didn't think. You were just like, mm, steak. Mm, steak. <laughs> well, it's because I spent the last half hour. I was like, was he stabbed? Was he stabbed twice? Was he stabbed... At the same time, from two different knives? Is that what happened? I forgot about the name of the episode completely. So it, That's probably I, I, a better path. Right. Unless it's called, like, Cat Wife. Then you're like, there better be a Cat Wife. <laughs> but when they bring up such a great expression like that, the title comes back to me, is all. Yeah, yeah I wasn't the whole time going, what does the title mean? What does the title mean? <laughs> Tell me. Were you talking like the Cowardly Lion? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, what does it mean? What does it mean? I'm scared. <laughs> Do not scare me. <laughs> I'm doing the whole podcast like that now. Sorry. Please. Uh, there were so many great Oh, it's lines. over already. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> so many great lines. <laughs> it, it'll come back. Don't worry. I'll vote in. <laughs> uh, yeah, but if your aunt wore pants, she'd be your uncle. <laughs> I'm not even sure what that means, but I'm going to use it going forward. Uh, <laughs> don't call me cheap. Do you city slickers? I'm the town whittler. That <laughs> that was a I'm great a, line. I'm gonna throw you to the curb to see how high you bounce. Just nice tough guy dialogue throughout, yep. oh. and really kind of rat a tat tat, but not too over the top either. Not like which I love, but it's not Broadway as my beat. Yeah, wax. No, it wasn't poetic. too much. Everybody, stop! I got some things to say. <laughs> right, I found the noir of it to be so understated that it was not distracting. It was just an you know, it was well, yeah, it's kind of a nice rustic layer. small town noir, yeah. which I really like. Yeah, yeah, and there's honestly a little, on a granular level, some differences between like film noir, which I do associate with uh, more poetic 
visuals, obviously, even in radio visuals, um, and hard boiled. That is just the nitty gritty crime story, and that's mm-hmm. what this is. And it is a uh, pretty flawless in its execution yeah. and the other thing i thought that was interesting about it is this is a very early episode of suspense yeah yeah uh, they figured out how to do this show well quickly um but really this is a big jump forward in style yeah for suspense the earlier ones before this we've listened to a handful of them yep. not counting the real outlier which was the hitchhiker which came actually before this episode right um but they were m- mostly written by john dixon carr and were these over the top locked room mysteries and they're great but they feel like a different show yeah this really starts to feel a lot like suspense it's a thriller it has Mm -hmm. the twist ending but it has really relatable characters it really puts you into the story in a way that i think suspense will continue to do going forward it's just missing a high profile Hollywood star. That was what I was going to ask, because it, in the intro, it, it seemed as though the guy who played Wilbur was somebody that would be an identifiable name at the time, which I did not identify. Genial character actor yes. is how they describe him, which I love. Right. I think that's how we should start describing Tim. Thank you. You really are. <laughs> oh, thanks. Genial character actor, <laughs> Tim Uran. <laughs> You're also a genial character. Aw. 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 Don't say the word genial in your head too many times. It gets weird. Genial. I hung a guy in a cell. <laughs> Genial. Oh, and that whole sequence that you said you love so much when Scott confronts Wally. Yeah. Wally's such an interesting character because yeah. he's so complicated and his actions and his words are very contradictory. Like when Scott comes in there, there's a line where he says, don't do it. Don't reach for the gun. I've got you covered. So we know that Wally... <laughs> right up to that moment, if he could get away with it, was going to shoot his way out of there. Mm-hmm. But once that happens, he is just mellow and compliant. Resigned. And resigned, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he just goes through his story. And he has just hung an innocent man to yeah. death in the prison cell. But when Scott asks him who printed these flyers, he's like, no. Yeah, no, no names. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protect this guy. Yeah. He's just a guy who did a job for me. So he Needed has this, some money. Yeah, he has these really shifting sense of... Morals. Yeah. And it might be um, related to class again. This was probably a guy who needed a quick buck who made these mm-hmm. flyers. Right. But he resented uh, Furman because Richie. he had money. Money pants. I think overwhelmingly suggests that Wally was a good human being that was presented with an opportunity acted on it for a huge life-changing moment and then instantly regretted it. And the reason I say that is because at the end, that regret and the, uh, the resignment of, yeah, I, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but, you know, I really screwed up and here's what happened and I deserve what's coming to me kind of talk at the end. Uh, yeah, but I don't think it's I screwed up. It's like, you got me. Because he would have, I think, shot his way out of there if he could. I'm not so sure. And felt bad about it later. I'm not so sure. I'm trying to remember. Uh, he uh, went for his gun. I know. He saw who it was walking to the door. He wasn't just shooting blindly. It I feels don't, like I think he, a good person given an I'd opportunity a making a bad choice. And a real person yeah. who's complicated and contradictory in many ways. I can't remember the, yeah. the, while he was working with the, air quote, missing wife. So why did she show up? It seemed to surprise him that she was there. Am I getting those details wrong that it suddenly... Well, she never knew Wally as Wally the policeman. Right. She only knew no, him as, in New York. Uh, as Wally the undercover. Not Wally. He, I can't remember what his name was. Yeah. He had a totally different name. His so name was she, not Wally. Because yeah. she, she yelled it out when she walked in the room. Harry or something like that. Yeah, right. Um, not Wally. Yeah. She only <laughs> came to town because uh, the word had got back that her husband had because somebody else committed suicide yeah gotcha let me ask you this and our slight disagreement of wally Mm -hmm. did you end up at the end with any empathy for him at all uh or or not because in that final discussion between scott and wally i love that dialogue so much at the end the horse is in the barn right Mm -hmm. and yet we get this this whole conversation between these two guys that were close and had good friends by the end of that conversation I think one of the reasons I was led to think, ah, I think he's a good guy that made a bad choice, uh, was just by the end of that, I felt kind of sorry for him. I felt a sort of sympathetic kinship yeah. in the worst way of like, 
he thought he was smart enough to do it, and that's part of why he did it. Because it was a little bit of ego, mm-hmm. and hubris. Yes. And I said, and I was like, and we all, we do all have ego and hubris, but that's not a great thing for us to have. Not me. It felt not you. You're just genial. Aww. <laughs> it felt tragic to me because I guess we can find a compromise between how sure. we interpret him. Is that yes, there se- he seems to be a guy who had opportunities in life if he hadn't been so weak to make these really immoral mistakes. This guy he hung was a guy who just loved his wife was just desperate to find her and win her back. I guess I keep forgetting that right. he hung that guy. <laughs> I keep forgetting they that. They don't. They, he, he, he hung a guy. Blackjacked him, right? His only they regret about it was like... put those I, two things together in yeah, the scene. Right. Yeah. I should have put an extra towel over that blackjack. That's his only regret. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I left evidence. But you're right. It feels bittersweet at the end. I'm, yeah. I, I don't think you're wrong there. And, you, and, and part of that's a, how Scott treats him. Yep. Because right. Scott knows his potential. It fl- to me, I flash back to that line at the beginning when he says, you're going to do well in this job someday. Mm-hmm. But not anymore. That's Scott's tough stake. Should we vote on this? Yeah. Hey, I'm going to be really uh, sincere here. I- not only do I find this to be a classic, uh, I-, I haven't had time to sit down and look at all the episodes of Suspense I've listened to. But I would have a hard time believing this didn't make my top five, possibly top three suspense. Um, I always go to On a Country Road. And what's the one where they're flying the plane? Uh, oh, uh, the Long, long the, night. the Long Night. Absolutely. Old men remember things. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely ranks up there with those that stick in my head forever. And this will stick with me forever. I like the production value. Uh, you're absolutely right, Jess. The trains and the sound. <laughs> and again, what could be been a dangerous pitfall for this was that discussion at the end that was a tricky thing to put in at the end of this like do we really need all this information but it turns out we weren't quite done we knew the murder was you know what i mean the horse is in the barn so why do we need to know anything more and that's where it got really interesting for me that we got a little more human insight Mm -hmm. to the whole thing great example of a strong script and strong performances Mm -hmm. just combining to elevate the entire production. Yep. I remember, we, I can't remember what the context was, but having a discussion with someone about when we talk about a good director, um, like how do you, in a story, in, a, in listening to or watching something, discern like this was well-directed or badly directed, like how much is this just all good actors and the director doesn't matter. But I would say this is really well-directed in, in that, I mean, one, it's, I have not read the story, but it seems like a great source material. And they really captured the texture of the whole thing in the performances, in the uh, sound effects, in the production, in the music. Just it's all of yep. one whole piece, and it all works together very well, and it's all executed excellently. So, yeah, this is a, a classic. It's uh, offbeat a little bit. It's not typical sort of hard-boiled story, but it is a classic hard-boiled story at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with everything you guys said. This is just a beautiful little nugget of hard-boiled storytelling and i think the reason i appreciate it so much is that by the 40s with the rise in film noir and the popularity of hammett and chandler it was hard to get anything hard-boiled on screen i think or on the radio that didn't have this slight element of pastiche to it Mm -hmm. that was just a pure translation of hard-boiled from page to the new medium and this has a real purity to it it hasn't exaggerated anything or tried to really beat you over the head with huh huh this is that popular stuff everyone's reading it's just not a a parody of itself translation and it's really good and i would definitely consider it a classic um and it really wards repeat listens i've heard this before and then listening to it I think twice for this recording, new things keep jumping out at me each time I listen to it. And you're absolutely right. I am now thinking about steak. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Tim, tell them stuff. Uh, Please go visit ghoulishdelights.com. That is the home of this podcast. Uh, If you want to let us know what you thought of this episode, you can leave comments, you can vote in polls, you can send us a message. Um, If you want to make a request for things that we'd like to listen to, I'll be honest, it helps if you're a Patreon member, but uh, you don't have to be. (laughs) I mean, we get a little preference. Uh, but we do try to get to everything that gets sent in. Um, but you can send us messages. 
you can also link to our social media pages, link to our Threadless store. Um, I, I've seen some folks started picking up the new T-shirts. I, I saw a photo on Facebook. Pretty awesome. Oh. Um, and you can also link to our Patreon page and become a supporting member of this podcast. Yes, join the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society by going to patreon.com slash the morals and support this podcast. We have all sorts of amazing perks. We do happy hours. Do you want to just hang out with me and Eric and Tim and a lot of really fun, clever insightful uh fans of old time radio i'm very genial (laughs) super (laughs) genial uh that's one of our perks every month it's a lot of fun um we have bonus podcasts we have pretty much that but it's exciting we also have a book club you can join me uh about every six weeks on zoom for a mysterious old book club so what are you waiting for but if you're really like "Uh, i don't want to give you guys money Every single month, forever. Well, it's kind of cheap of you, but <laughs> we do offer another alternative. You can give a one-time donation uh, to us at ghoulishdelights.com. Right now, we are collecting money for a new computer, and we are getting really close to being able to buy a really nice computer for this podcast. And we'd like to take a moment to thank so many people who've already contributed. Yes, thank you, Bill. Brian, Anne Marie, Linda, Shane, Mark, DBA, Jeffrey, Micah, Ryan, Roberta, Catherine, Carolyn, Loretta, Lori, and if you have given something to us in the time since we recorded this, but you're hearing this, um, sorry to not mention it right now, but you know that's how time works. We will say thank you in at, when we can. See how genial he is. He's apologizing <laughs> for linear time. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who's donated and everyone who can who uh, is has yet to donate. It really helps us out a lot. This sounded like the end of Romper Room. <laughs> wow. No? That's a deep cut. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, if you'd like to see... No, us... no, no. How did Romper Room end? Because at the end, they would say, uh, they would look into the the camera and say, I see, and they would just mention names. Like, and you you're would right. wait it's for now your coming name back to, me. to get read. And if they ever said, Eric, you're like, oh my God, yes, they said my name. Oh my God, they can see me. <laughs> <laughs> If you'd like to see us performing live, the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society is also a theater company that does live stage audio drama. And you can see us performing recreations of classic old time radio and a lot of our own original work as we perform a couple times a month uh, for almost five, six years to find out where we're performing, what we're performing and how to get tickets. Go to ghoulishdelights.com or Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society.com. And if you can't make it, you're not in the area, what have you. Being a Patreon, one of the perks of that, also is that uh, we film them and you get that to watch that as part of being a Patreon. So do that. Come see us or do something. <laughs> uh, what are we uh, doing next? Next, we are going to be listening to a two-part episode of Suspense. Donovan's Brain, Part 1. Until then... I see you, Eric.